If you've ever tried to fit a square peg into a round hole, it will never work. I felt like a square peg in a round hole a little while back when I was around my teenage son and a lot of his mates. I dropped my son off one evening at McDonald's, where lots of his friends were, and I got out to get something from McDonald's at the same time. And first thing I noticed, they were dressed quite different to me. But the biggest difference I noticed was the different language they used when they spoke to each other. Look, like any good dad who's a little bit cool, I thought I would learn a bit of their lingo. <laughs> well, I wanted a bit of a chat with my son and the boys on their, on their level, so it made sense to me to do this, right? So what I'd done is I researched it, got on Google, had a little look, see what I could find. Well, if I'm honest, I felt even more like a square peg in a round hole by the end of it. Did you know the word fam means friend? Gucci, what I always thought was clothing, means cool. And the best one, and cheddar, what is cheese, means money. <laughs> in the end, I decided that in this situation, being square was all right. <laughs> I'll stay as I am. But you may have noticed, something you may have noticed over the last week, and actually a little bit when Je Jez spoke as well, since we've been looking in Mark's gospel, is that Jesus didn't seem to fit in with the religious leaders either. Every time Jesus was with the contemporary religious leaders of his time, there was confrontation and disagreement. They, every time he's with them, they started to get a bit salty with him. This is one of the words I learned from my Google search. <laughs> if you feel at the moment right now, like a round peg in a square hole, let me just relieve you from that. I'll tell you what it means. It means irritated or angry, if you didn't know. But putting all the joking aside, I think the question I'm going to ask now is a good question to ask ourselves. Why didn't Jesus fit in with the contemporary leaders of his time? Well, I think last week's passage pointed to one of the reasons Jesus didn't fit in, to, fit in with the religious leaders. Jesus loved, cared, and showed compassion for sinners. Whereas the religious leaders totally looked down on them. But I also think the verses we're going to look at today show some contrasting points which reveal why Jesus didn't fit in and why he must have felt like a square peg in a round hole when he was around them. So this morning, we're going to consider three contrasts which show why Jesus does not fit in with the religious leaders of his time. But before we do that, we're going to pray and read the verses. So, if you've got a Bible with you, open it to Mark chapter 2. We're looking from verse 18 into chapter 3, verse 6. I'll just give you a second to do that. I've got it on a PowerPoint as well. Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. Jesus said, no one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, a new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into an old wineskin. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. On the Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields. And as the disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. And the Pharisees said, said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for the priest to eat. And he also gave some of the companions. He also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man. 
apologies. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Another time, Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with a shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil? To save or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we want to meet with you this morning, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this time of worship, Lord. Through the worship, through the the song worship, through the preaching, Lord. We just pray, Lord, that we can know and seek your kingdom. Lord, I pray that you'd come and speak into our hearts as a church, as a family. But Lord, I also pray that you'd speak to us individually this morning. Lord, we just ask for your favor upon all things. In Jesus' name. Amen. The first point is the contrast between sorrow and joy. Jesus asked, Jesus was asked why his disciples are not fasting in verse 18. And he answered them in his standard way by asking them a question back. He does it a lot. Jesus said back to them, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But what is Jesus, what is he getting at by saying this? Well, let let us look at the practice of fasting in the ancient world first. I think that will be helpful. The only time it was mandatory to fast was once a year on the Day of Atonement for God's people. The Day of Atonement was one day of the year in the Jewish calendar that God forgave sin. On this day, God's people were called to fast from food, or as it says in Leviticus, deny yourself. Another reason we find people fasting in the Old Testament was in times of sorrow. Examples of this include prophets who fasted in sorrow when God's people rebelled and had hard hearts against God and God's people. Or if they lost a loved one, someone might fast out of the feeling of grief. We can see that fasting was mainly used in times of sorrow or grief in the Old Testament. And sorrow is the opposite to joy. And if, and if you're a guest of a bridegroom at a wedding, this would be a time to rejoice and be full of joy. So when we think about Jesus' question, how can, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? We can picture a wedding and imagine it would be, joy, it would be a joyful time. For everyone involved. The late R. Alan Cole paraphrases Jesus' question here, and I thought this was really helpful when I read it. He says this, In a time of joyous fellowship, who thinks of fasting? When you're at a party and the party's in full swing and you're supposed to be joyful, who stops and goes, hold on, everyone, it's time to fast. The idea of the wedding, the idea of this is to be having a good time. It's to to be joyful. In Jesus' illustration, the bridegroom's guests represent the disciples. And the bridegroom represents Jesus. Not because of marriage, no. But because of what Jesus was saying, doing, and going to do. Remember, Jesus' disciples are with the Son of God and Israel's anointed king. The news Jesus is proclaiming is good news. Amen? As he's telling the people that God's kingdom has arrived through himself. This is amazing. Cole goes on to say that fasting is, in the Bible, a sign of disaster or penance or mourning or voluntary absence of the Spirit. How could Jesus' disciples mourn when the king was with them? Surely that should be a time of joy, shouldn't it? We should be joyful if Jesus is with us. 
Sorry, we're excited. Um, <laughs> woo! <laughs> so I'm out of breath. <laughs> but Jesus did not condone fasting. I think it's important to get that across. He said it himself in, those te- in the text. When the bridegroom was taken away from them, the disciples will mourn and fast. Jesus, it, I would suggest, he's alluding to the, his death on the cross. However, the disciples grieving and fasting would be over Jesus because of his death on the cross. But this is not permanent. All believers in Jesus know this. This is not going to be permanent. Jesus rose from the dead. And they will celebrate Jesus' victory over sin and death. So this will not be a permanent time of sorrow. Three days he rises. Jesus is good news. We should celebrate Jesus because we all need Jesus. I need Jesus. You need Jesus. Everyone in Sombre needs Jesus. When we tell people about Jesus, our neighbours, our families, our friends, people in Nando's, we should speak in ways that show joy. Our news is good news. And we should be like those at a wedding when the party is in full swing because we know Jesus and we will be with him in eternity. He is our king. But before we get carried away and start doing the Congo down Green Street together, just out of utter joy, let's just compose. Um, I will compose myself just for a bit longer. I'm not going to ask you to do the Congo in a minute anyway. Before we look... But what I want to do is, before we look at the next two parables that come after that, I'd like us to consider the rest of the passage. So please, would you jump to verse 23? The second contrast I I want to draw out, I want to draw it out, is choosing to do good over observing rules. The Pharisees question Jesus about why the disciples were working on the Sabbath as they were picking grain in a field to eat. So why are you working? Jesus responds by asking the Pharisees questions to do with the story of King David in the Old Testament, which they would have read and they would have known this very well. But the main point to pick up in the story was the bread set before the Lord was unlawful for anyone to eat apart from the priest. However, as King David and his men were starving, the priest breaks the rule and gives the bread to David and his men. His actions were motivated by love. He wants them to eat and not starve. This points to doing good over observing rules and tradition. This becomes even clearer in the synagogue when Jesus healed the man with a withered hand. Again, The confrontation with the religious leaders is on the Sabbath. Jesus Jesus questioned questioned them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to to do, or sorry, is, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? So this is Jesus speaking. He said back to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? To save, or you could call it heal, to heal life or to kill. Jesus saw it was more important to do good than to observe religious rules and practices of the time. Both of the stories highlight doing good. One shows the importance of making sure David's men and their health was good, and that this was more important than keeping the commands set out for the priests. The other shows Jesus healing a man and that bringing goodness and life, or like I said, healing was more important than keeping the religious leaders' expectations on the Sabbath. This is not about breaking the command. It's it's the expectation of the religious leaders is the problem. He's looking past the commands. He's saying, well, actually, where are you taking this? It's important to remember that the Sabbath was a holy day which God made for humanity. This means that one day of the week, God's people could stop working to rest and be with God. It was meant to refresh the people and build them up before they started working again. It was a day to reflect on God and draw close to him. It wasn't meant to become incredibly restrictive as the religious leaders started to see it. 
Jesus didn't stand in front of the man with a withered hand and get out his rule book so he could look up what was right and wrong to do in this situation on the Sabbath. He doesn't do that. No, he chose to do good. He knew this would be his father's heart for him to do, to care for the human needs in front of him on the Sabbath day. This contrast sadly highlights that the hearts of the religious leaders had become so uptight about keeping to rules that even the idea of caring for human needs on the Sabbath felt out of the question for them. It's heartbreaking. They were so angry about Jesus healing on the Sabbath that even in verse 6 it says that after Jesus healed the man, they started to plot how to kill him. The final contrast I'd like us to consider is new over old. To do this, I want us to look at verses 21 to 22. So I'm just going to recap and we're going to read them again. Jesus said, No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins. And both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. What do these two lessons mean? If I'm honest, I found these really hard to understand. So I took a bit of time to unpack it for myself. And I'm going to try to explain it to you. So I'm hoping it'd be helpful, or if it's not, we're all going to be really confused. (laughs) Jesus was using the contemporary day-to-day things that people at the time would have been familiar with to make his point. He talks about sewing a hole in clothing and finding ways to how we store wine. So when the audience heard Jesus talking about patching up a garment and putting new wine into a wineskin, they would have understood the point he was making because his illustration related to their day-to-day lives. Yeah? It would be like us today trying to make an illustration and using a mobile phone. It's something that most people would know what a mobile phone is, yeah? What I think Jesus is saying is that no one would use a new patch of cloth to patch over a hole in an old garment because a new patch of cloth with all its new fibers would shrink and pull away from the old garment, making it worse. This means that patching over the old garment would not work. Jesus has not come to patch over the old religious rituals of the past. He has come to do a new thing and provide a new way to God. What Jesus is illustrating is that the old is is incompatible with the new. Yeah? So the old is incompatible with the new. Another way we, we could think about this is that Jesus did not come to put a patch over the old religious rituals that the religious leaders were following. He's not putting a patch over this. Their ways were incompatible with the new way, faith in Christ. The second illustration, the the wineskin, illustrates this in a different way. It suggests that putting new wine in an old skin is not good. An old wineskin is old and warm because of the fermenting of the wine. Putting fresh wine that will ferment into an old wineskin means the old wineskin will eventually what? Burst. Metaphorically, Jesus' message cannot be contained in the old wineskin. Jesus is the new. He is the new one and the new patch that he's illustrating. He came to do something new with a totally different approach. Jesus is not an attachment or an addition to the existing religious structures. He cannot be contained by the old religious rituals that the religious leaders put into place. We must remember that Jesus is not discarding the past, but he came to fulfill the law and the Old Testament promises and provide a way for people to know God. I think that's really important for us. We must remember that Jesus is not discarding the past, but he came to fulfill the law and all the Old Testament promises and provide a way for people to know God. Jesus lived a perfect life. 
and died on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins. So all we need to do is put our faith in Christ. Then he will save us from death and give us the gift of eternal life and, and being restored back into a relationship with our Father God. I think the late author and pastor, Donald English, sums it up well. He speaks about these two illustrations, the behavior of the religious leaders and their pious ways in keeping to tradition and what Jesus had come to do. He said that Jesus is not saying that the old should be discarded. He is affirming that what has now come far surpasses all that went before. The old should not hold back the new, however, by making it conform to its shape. Jesus is doing a new thing. He surpasses what was before. The contrast is highlighting that the old religious rituals are ways of the past and are the old way. But Jesus came to bring salvation through his work upon the cross. And this is the new way. These three points all contrast different things. Joy over sorrow. Doing good over rules. New over old. But they all highlight that Jesus came to do a new thing. This new thing really upset the status quo. For example, look at how the religious leaders act towards him. No wonder Jesus felt the odd one when he was with them. No wonder he felt like a square peg in a round hole. But I think there's another contrast that this text points towards. And this contrast is life and death. What is important for us to draw out of this text is that works-based religion leads to death and faith in Jesus leads to life. This is important for us to get our heads around. It really is. Just take a sec to look at what I've put there. We struggle with this. Even as Christians, we can struggle with this. Let me read it again. What is important for us to draw out of the text is that works-based religion leads to death and faith in Jesus leads to life. Wow. Thinking that work-based religion, is, or, or another way of putting it, because you know, it's a bit of a religious way of saying it, what about self-sufficiency? Will get, get us into God's good books. It's not true. Guys, it's not true. Only Jesus leads to life. Only Jesus is the way to the Father. It's through him. The religious leaders thought their ways of living and observing man-made rules were right in God's eyes. But this was not true. And it's not true for us today. I'm sorry if this upsets you, but as a pastor or a preacher, I love you all enough to be honest about God's word. You cannot work your way into heaven or into Jesus' good books by observing certain practices or being good. It's not happening. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way, I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Only in Jesus can you be set free from sin. Only in Jesus can you be restored back into a loving relationship with your Father. Guys, you need him this morning, so do not hesitate to come to, to know Jesus right now and start building a relationship with your Father. This text is so important for us at Open Door Church as Jesus is doing a new thing here. We I like a new wine and a new wineskin. We, we, we have a new lead pastor, a senior leadership team. We are considering the direction of the church and seeking God for a fresh vision. We honour the past, but we look to Jesus for the future of the church. We would like to be a church that becomes even more welcoming than it already is. We were welcomed in church, but we want, to be, we want to work at this and be more of it. We, everyone, all churches can do that. We would like to do this by being a church that learns to allow people to belong with us before they believe. It's very different to how it was 40, 50 years ago. 
This gives us an opportunity to meet people where they are in life and journey with them, loving them towards Jesus. This approach may be different for many of you, and I ask that you would pray about supporting this. I said last week, why don't we pray about always having 10% of those who join us on, a sun, on Sundays as a continuous flow of non-Christians? 10%. If we are a church of 100 people or a church of 500 people, 10% of that is non-Christians. A continuous flow of people that know, need to know the king. That's, that, do we not want that? Do you know what I mean? To be a church that is with people that are new, don't know him. To, to love them. Walk with them towards Jesus. You may feel you want the, want the church on a Sunday to only have believers in it. But society is different today, and we must think differently about how we approach people. We do. Today's generation want to seek, learn, and belong before they, cho- before they make choices. And we should be ready to love them and journey with them. We really should. Why don't we learn to make non-Christians that join us not feel like they're square pegs in round holes or the odd one in the room? We don't want to do that. I'm not saying we do. Well, we might sometimes. I think we can only check our own hearts for that. But why don't we try going the extra mile in caring for them, being friendly, and making them in every way feel welcomed so they want to come back and join us at Open Door Church? That's what we should do. I'm going to ask George to come back up. He's going to strum. We had a big argument earlier because I said, keyboard, that's strumming, and then we'd have worship band said, that's not. If that's playing or something. And I was like, what's the difference? You're still strumming. You're not singing. I just want you to do something. They're like, Ollie, just leave it, leave it, leave it. I felt like a square pig in a round hole. <laughs> Please stand. Please stand. Let's respond.